my time with Pastor Picasso. Hashtag Pastor Picasso is nearly at an end, and yes, that's sad. I've put it through a number of special tests, and it's done quite well in some of those special tests, like I've stuck it on a rolling road to see how much power it still has, and it nearly does have all the power. And then I tried to remap it to see if you can remap a 513,000 mile Zara Picasso, and it turns out if you don't have the right map file, you can't. But now it faces its sternest test of all. Can it prove me wrong? I don't fancy its chances. I say prove me wrong because back in 2015, we had my family, a Zara Picasso, kind of like this one. Slightly lower mileage than this one, but it was kind of like this one. And we'd had that for about four years and it had done sterling service, but we opted to replace it. We got rid of it. We replaced it with one of these. I know that's clever, isn't it? Yes, we replaced our Zara Picasso with a Ford S-Max. Now this isn't a particularly fair test because the Ford S-Max that we replaced our Zara Picasso with is actually this Ford S-Max, which you might have really seen if you watch, I can't remember, he came down, guy, YouTuber, bloke, hub, not, up. he came down, YouTuber bloke, came down here, took him for a drive, found him caressing the wiper, which was we decided that's when the test would end. But in real life, this car actually replaced our Picasso. Our Picasso is now past tense, sadly. It no longer exists. But the S-Max very much does. So I thought, why not put them head to head? Why not have a test between them? One replaced the other. I mean, it's completely not fair because this was a sort of, well, I don't know, 10, 12, 13,000 pound, not mini MPV, but it is based on the segment below. Uh, with a 2 litre HDI engine, so 90 horsepower, kind of basic, cheap, knock them out nice and quick. This, I mean, is a Ford, so this is also cheap and kind of knock it out nice and quick, but it was a lot more expensive. This was a 20 odd thousand pound car. This has a 2.5 litre Volvo Turbo 5 cylinder petrol engine in it. It actually has, and I haven't worked out the figures yet, but I will, and I will put them on the screen now. This many more times power than this, because this has also been on the rolling road. So I have the actual figures that this has produced and the actual figures that this has produced. Also, this has done 513,200 and something. Is it gonna tell me? No, 513,200 and something miles. This is about 135,000, so yeah. But that kind of makes it interesting, doesn't it? And then I, it's my channel, I don't care. I'm just gonna compare them, so yeah, cope. So this Zara Picasso needs no introduction. It is royalty, it is YouTube royalty, Twitter royalty, well, weird car Twitter royalty. It's been around. So for those who don't know this car, people who might be watching this because they're wanting to see the S-Max stuff, bear with me, this car is quite special. It's done 513,200 and something thousand miles from new, genuinely. And yeah, it's a bit shabby and everything in places, but let's give it a break. It's allowed to be. So this is a two liter HDI SX model. Because it's an SX, that means it has velour. Very sort of early noughties, late nineties French velour, which has crazy patterns in it. It's not the highest spec Picasso ever made, but at the time it was made, it was the highest spec Picasso. It does still have windy rear windows, which work absolutely fine. These were cheap cars. They're based on the same platform, which is kind of like a beefed up Zara platform, um, basically shared with the Blingo van. Um, it's, a, it's a basic car. It's, it really is. I know they look a bit funny, but you couldn't accuse it of being boring, could you? Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's going backwards or forwards, but... So the Picasso was based on the Zan A concept car, which looked... Actually, to be fair to the Citroen, it was another one of their cars like the C6 that took the concept car and actually ended up looking, ended up looking fairly similar to it. Although the Zan A had like swivelling front seats. I think it might have had hyd hydrodynamic suspension. I'm not sure, but yeah, I mean... You've seen these, they need no introduction. These things were absolutely everywhere. They were massively successful for Citroen. My wife used to work for a Citroen dealership. And when this was replaced by the C4 Picasso, which looks a fair bit more stylish, despite the fact it is still an MPV and therefore unstylish. When the C4 came out, people were still buying these because they were 9995. They're just so cheap, but 
it lasts, it works. A good motor. This car is powered by a two litre HDI engine, uh, commonly used by Peugeot and Citroen. And uh, it was one of their, well, it was their first common rail diesel engine. It wasn't the first common rail diesel engine full stop on the market. I think that accolade went to Fiat, but it was not far behind. It's a good engine. It's an evolution of the XUD that basically went in, well, everything good with a diesel engine um, up until 1997. Um, yeah, it's an evolved version of that with an ECU and high pressure fuel rail, and it does really, really well. It's a great engine. It's not a fun engine. It's not a fast engine. It's just an engine. But for that purpose, it's very, very good. Obviously, there is some re-entry damage here. Uh, this has done many, many miles, and it looks like it's done them at many, many miles an hour. Hyper-velocity Picasso, but uh, yeah. Looks like the atmosphere's whew, taken it off. Now, while the Picasso was launched in 2000, I think it was it 2000? Yeah, 2000 this was launched, based on sort of architecture that harks back all the way to the early 90s, possibly late 80s, depending on how far you go back. The S-Max was launched in, I don't know, I have no idea. 2006, because this, that's right, 2006, because this is a very, very early one. This car, as you can see, comes from, this is not a private plate, I'm not like that, but this is, uh, this car is actually from Northern Ireland, um, County Antrim, I think, and it, somehow it's found its way over here. Um, if it was on a UK plate, it would be an 06. This car was built in June 2006, so it's a very early 2.5 litre turbo titanium S-Max. Um, this is actually, same as the Picasso, at the time it was made, top of the range. I mean, they got more posh as time went on, as did the Picasso, but when, this, when the S-Max first came out, this was as high as they go. If you'd listened in school and gone to college and done well in university, this is what you bought. The platform underneath this car is basically the Mark IV Mondeo, so it was quite a new platform at the time. And as any fool know, a Mark IV Mondeo is probably one of the best cars ever made because it does everything you need. The ride is good, the handling is good, they're cheap to buy, they're easy to work on, blah blah blah, it goes on and on and on. They're all the car anyone ever needs. So to make a car on that platform higher, wider, with more space inside it, it's a win. Only it goes deeper than that. Nowadays we have SUVs because MPVs like this and like the Picasso have been deemed to be uncool. But driving around in a big high up fake off roader with big ground clearance for no reason, lots of additional weight, as much space inside as a normal estate car and much less safety potential on the outside for pedestrians should you hit one, that's deemed perfectly cool. Anyway. Ford actually went a slightly different way to this because you will also know, if you know your people carriers, that they've made the Galaxy. The Galaxy shared the same platform as this, but it had a little bit more length on the end here, and it was a bit higher here. And that was their MPV. This wasn't, according to Ford. I mean, I'm looking at that thinking, that looks like an MPV to me. But it wasn't. This was an SAV. SAV. This was a sports activity vehicle, so basically their marketing people thought it would be a good idea to make an MPV that was more car-like, because then people can have all the practicality of an MPV, but have the enjoyment of a normal car. And they tried to give it a good image, I mean it's got things like fake vents on the side here, which do nothing at all. And it's got like a sloping roof line, and this kink, it's funky. Actually not a bad looking car, as proportions go, for an MPV, this is probably about as good as they get. So that was Ford's marketing team came up with this weird thing, this SAV thing. But it actually worked. It really does work. This is probably, in my mind, and if I cast my mind back to everything Ford have made, and I have to admit, I'm not Ford's biggest fan. I don't, you know, some of them I quite like, some of them I think are bang average. I think, as a whole, the mark is largely overrated, um, and people's thoughts on it are guided by nostalgia or what's simple to work on. But I will take off my hat, which I'm not wearing. This is one of the best cars they ever made. This is brilliant. It does everything. And there are lots of things I don't like about it, but it ticks every box. So the Picasso's got a bit of a fight on its hands. I mean, the difference in the size of the wheels kind of tells you everything you need to know about the two areas these cars were made. 185, 65, R15. Steel wheels, although alloys were an option. Big sidewalls, comfort, simplicity, 
less rolling resistance, good economy. 18 inch wheels, 235, 45 by 18 with extra load sidewalls because of the weight of the car. This is more about, I was gonna say sportiness and trying to be sporty, but really it's just trying to look sporty because it's not a sporty car, it's a people carrier. I mean, it is not a sporty car at all, but it tries its hardest to be one. This doesn't. This is unashamedly a people carrier. And to be fair, if I was dishing out respect to Citroen or to Ford for which way they went, I would give Ford respect for the fact that they've managed to build something that is not atrocious to drive, but still does the job of a people carrier pretty well. But I'd probably give more respect to Citroen just for the bloody mindedness to say, well, it's a people carrier. I'm not going to try and make it a sports car. I'm not going to try and make it a sporty estate. It's a people carrier. So make it a people carrier. So that's more ballsy for me, that design. That's out of those two. That's trying to be popular. That's just them going, we've made this. If you don't like it, go away. But plenty of people did like it. I mean, lots of people don't, but plenty did. It's gotta be said, in the back of the Picasso, there's a decent amount of space. I'm talking into my microphone like this because otherwise it rubs me. In the back of the Picasso, you have a decent amount of space. You have good leg room. This seat here is set for me. Um, plenty of space, a completely flat floor. Big flat floor, big flat floor, big flat floor, big flat floor. Um, you have a picnic table here with a little diagram or with a little artistic impression, a sketch of a Picasso there, which is lovely. Children will really appreciate that. It's a good space to be. Now, the, one of the key differences with a Picasso is you get the three full-size seats across the back. Now, a lot of cars didn't have that. The McGann Scenic, when that came out, that didn't have the three full-size seats. And then the Zafira came along, and that pretty much didn't have three individual seats at all. I mean, it did, but not quite. This has three full-size seats. So I say full-size. I mean, I'm not a small person, but I'm also not a massive person. And I'm either side of the seat. It's not bad, I mean you've got decent comfort I would say, the seats are not amazingly comfortable, quite firmly you know, sprung, but most cars are these days. Sculpted, not too bad, yeah, fairly comfortable. The ride in the back here, I can speak from experience, the ride isn't too bad. The suspension in these cars are really set up for comfort and it's not a bad place to travel. In fact my children, when they travelled in the back of this car go to go to Thruxton to see the BTCC, um, having been used to travelling in the S-Max, remarked on how comfortable it was. So, that's the best kind of, you know, test you could put it through really, isn't it? Citroen. Now the S-Max is a bigger car, so we should be a little bit pragmatic about this when comparing the Picasso to this car, but this is obviously a bigger car, and because it is my family car, it is disgusting. There is stuff everywhere. Ooh. So, what do I notice about this to the Picasso on the inside? Well, the seat is marginally wider, and there are three of them. It's also less comfortable. The backrest in particular is just a board. I mean, it's, it's just... It's not comfy in the slightest, and I have ridden in the back of this car recently for the first time ever, and the ride in the back is appalling. It's terrible. It's really bad. I think that's because you have the option of the third row of seats there, so you can take extra people, so you need to have quite stiff springing for that, whereas Picasso doesn't have to do that. Although it does have the rear axle from a van, so I'm not quite sure why that rides so much better. It's French, isn't it? Maybe that's why. But. A bit more legroom, it has to be said. The back of the seats have fallen off on this one um, because, well, contrary to popular belief, the build is worse on this car. Um, I would say it is anyway. But you have got lots of nice things. It's nicer colours because it's, well, it's black, so it's absence of colour. But yeah, it's, it's a nicer place to be, I would say, than the Picasso in terms of how it looks. It feels cosier, a bit more cocooned but it's no more comfortable. If anything, it's less comfortable. There is more legroom. There is not a flat floor, a big flat floor. There's a bigger floor, but it's not flat. Down here, there's a hump, which is annoying because it's a big car and you think, well, why the hell have they managed to do it with that? But you haven't managed it with this. But you do get 
air vents here so you get aircon blowing at you which is nice and the aircon in this car works unlike the Picasso um, in terms of storage space well it's about the same really you've got big door bins the Picasso has got built-in drinks holders in those door bins this doesn't I don't think nope they don't qualify but in this car's door bins we do find bits of race car there is some carbon fiber here is a bit of touring car because we go on track walks after the race there is a bit of tyre which has come off completely off a race car yeah you go on track walks and you just pick up crap basically I'd love to tell you there's more you know interesting things to talk about but yeah not really it's just I don't sit here so I don't care which car wins of the two that is a tough call I think I'm going to give it to the Picasso it's a smaller car on the outside it's 400 kilograms lighter than this car it has a flat floor the seats are more comfortable the aircon would be working yes it looks horrible compared to this this looks much nicer inside but that works better so yeah i'm gonna give it to the picasso and it's got tables obviously it's not just space in the back that's important space in the boot is important and this again the s max does have a slightly unfair advantage in the fact that it is a bigger car but the Picasso fights back. For starters, this dual opening boot is clever. It takes it up as far as that in case you're going to bang it on the roof of something if you're parked indoors, like in a garage or multi-storey car park. But if you do want to go a little bit higher, you can. It's not a DeLorean door where it was like not designed properly. It's, on, it's deliberate. The only downside is this boot lock here. Well, I mean, you could be killed if you bang your head on that it's horrendous but it's a decent sized boot there's all sorts of funny little touches like the parcel shelf lifts here but it's clipped here so if you do this it it's supposed to lift more but it doesn't probably because it's done 500,000 miles but yeah whatever um also this is a shopping trolley i'm not joking You see, if you want to take your Picasso somewhere and not have to get a trolley, like a plum, you simply take this apart without breaking it because it's old and plastic. And you do this, and then you clip this together, and you put that in the bottom. Look at that! Obviously anyone with a modicum of self-respect wouldn't actually use this because people could see you. I'm not someone who cares too much about my image, but even I have limits. This is, yeah, but it's a very, very clever idea, I think. And the beauty of it is that if you were to put it back in like this, it actually gives you a decent space to put things. You can put stuff like a ball. The boot is also a fair size should you wish to carry around a set of saucepans by Gino Di Campo. I don't, I don't get this. I don't get this. I, I, I've, yeah, no, right, so let's have a think. So if his gran had wheels, she'd be a bike. No, if she had wheels, she'd be disabled. She'd be in a wheelchair. That's not something to joke about. That's sad. I mean, you know, yeah, she'd be able to live a fulfilling life. I'm sure she could make a difference. People with physical disabilities are often the best people. They're awesome. But that's not something to make a joke about. And what's wrong with a carbonara? They're lush. The S-Max does have, as I say, a slightly unfair advantage in the... See, that's one of the problems with the S-Max. Your balls will fall out of the boot because there's no load lip because the seats are folded into the floor. This is a silly, silly design. But Gino De Campo's saucepans are in there so he can make his money on that and belittle disabled people, including his dear old Nan. Just loads of room behind them. Please ignore the scum everywhere. This, we, this is not, this is, someone didn't get sick in the car. Uh, this is when we did a garden tip run and there was something that went in the back that was rusty. It's a bit disgusting, I admit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an unfair thing to compare a car with a back end that big to the, I mean, this is huge in comparison, isn't it? It's just longer, full stop. Gino De Campo saucepans have plenty of room and 
they can be kept secure by this retractable sand blind, which is a very clever idea. I swear you'll never see anything like this ever again. The SMAX does have a party trick that the Picasso doesn't have, however, and I shall demonstrate this to you in real time. Remove the saucepans, ball. This is a party trick the Picasso cannot replicate. If only you could extend your house in the same way. You literally pull that and then have to be a bit careful about what goes on with this. There you go. And another one here. And now we have seven seats. We've lost the ball. And the ball now has a load lip. It can't fall out, look. Even the saucepans fit. See? It's a brilliant idea. To access the seats in the back, you simply pull this lever, the seat sides forward, you find litter because you cart kids around and they're disgusting. And now we have somewhere comfortable for adults to sit because there's a full size pair of seats here. I have my own leg room. I've got, I've got my own carpet mats even, you know. There's a drinks holder, headrests, seat belts. You know, there's no reason why you couldn't use this, you know, in an emergency. There's absolutely, it's a fantastic piece of design. Sorry. I want to say it's in a different league to the Picasso in terms of performance, but that's not really accurate because if we're honest, it's playing a different sport. It's not even the same ball game. Flawless victory. It seems somewhat unfair to compare the economy possible in the Picasso or the economy it's averaging with the economy of the S-Max. But life is unfair. The Picasso, is warning me it has low fuel. I'm just scrolling through the trip computer. It tells me I need to arrange the service as well. I'm not bothered about that. I want to know what the economy is. And that the door is open. I don't care. I know, I opened them. And it's low fuel. Apparently we have to start the engine because otherwise it won't let me see anything. Oh no, apparently we've got to go, th we're going to have all the warnings, the doors are open and we've got low fuel. It's not letting me go through the trip computer. This is a bad move by the Picasso, it's annoying me. That's not helping either. I know the key's in, because I put it there. I have now had to move inside the Picasso and shut the doors and start the engine. I had to put the handbrake down to get it to go away, right. Right, so the Picasso has averaged 49.6 miles to the gallon at 49 miles an hour. But it did make me put all the windows up, shut the doors, take the handbrake on and off, start the engine, just so I could see it. And it's very hot in here and the aircon doesn't work and now I'm in a grump, so I think the S-Max might win this one. So moving into the S-Max, Life is much easier because it will not make me jump through hoops to see what the economy is. Despite the fact the economy is not very good, it's happy to tell me what it is. I simply press OK. I know the door's open. Shush. And I can scroll through it straight away. 
to an average speed of 23 miles an hour since this trip computer was reset. It has averaged, and that shows you what kind of journeys this car is used for, it has averaged 25.7 miles to the gallon. Now, although the Picasso won that comfortably, I am annoyed by the fact that I had to do all that to get it to read it, whereas the S-Max was quite willing to show me, despite the fact that it wasn't particularly good, it was willing to be open and upfront. So, I want to give it to the S-Max. The S-Max is the moral victor, but the Picasso is the technical victor. How about costs? Well, in terms of running costs, the Picasso has it licked because for a start, the road tax or road fund license on this car is nearly half of what it is on this one. Despite the fact that this car is EULES compliant and this one is not. How's that for a just system? But yeah, I mean, in terms of running costs, Picasso, all the parts are cheaper. They're easier to get because this has got an odd engine in it. You don't get many with this engine in it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hands down win for the Picasso. And if you talk about buying costs, well, this car is probably worth, I mean, it's, it had a knock the other day. It's a bit tired in places, I admit, but it's a very rare color, a Colorado red 2.5 T titanium. I would, I have never, I've seen one other. I've seen one other. When this one was for sale, I saw another one in Kent, which is in half the mileage and I probably should have bought, but yeah, we saw one other, that's it. Um, with this engine, this spec and everything like that. This car, if we were to sell it now, Assuming we tidied it up, got some of the little niggles sorted on it, you, you really go to town on it, you might get like two, six, two, eight, you know, two and a half, you know, 2,800. Um, as it is, two, maybe, maybe just under, um, because it does need a little bit of titivation and love. Whereas the Picasso wins, because the Picasso is worth nothing. Genuinely, that is worth nothing. I mean, if this thing breaks, it will, I imagine it will just get given away, because it's worth I mean, it's got an MOT, so maybe it's worth 100 quid, but yeah. I mean, in every other respect, this is priceless. But in terms of resale, no, dickle. I did briefly consider crashing Vecchi, my old Iveco van, into the front of both of these cars at a solid 30 miles an hour to simulate which one would fare better in a crash. But happily, there is an organisation out there called Euro NCAP, and they've already done it for us. Well, they haven't crashed an Aveco daily into the front of them, but they've crashed these cars into a wall. And as you can probably imagine, the S-Max is a lot newer. Therefore, it's pretty much a lot better. Uh, it has a more advanced crash structure. It has more airbags. There's a cat. This cat, right? Hello, that's the cat that lives in Vecchi. Yeah. That cat, and it lives in the van. Uh, well, it doesn't, I think it lives in one of the houses over the road, but it seems to take up residence in the van. It's looking at the van now, thinking like, can I sneak into that van without him noticing? Is your bird in there? I've seen your bird. I'm not being, I'm not being like derogatory towards women. There's an actual bird, a carcass. Yeah, there he goes. Anyway, yeah, before the cat came, uh, yeah, the S-Max is safer. If I was in a crash one, I would rather crash this. I'd rather crash neither of them, really, but yeah. So if we're looking at it from a ride point of view, it's fair to say, yeah, the Picasso's got it licked. Much longer travel suspension, it's much softer. It's a little bit bleh, but yeah, I would say on the whole, it's probably, a, it's not even slightly better, it's a lot better. These ride quite well especially when you sat up front, maybe not so much in the back. But the downside of that is obviously it's more wallowy. But then, yeah, sure, the steering is a little bit woolly, not very direct, but do you need direct steering in a people carrier? No, I think not. People carriers are people carriers, not sports cars. I mean, the S-Max might have it licked on handling. I think when it comes to the ride handling balance, the S-Max is actually really good. I think it's really, really good. But it does favour the handling over the ride. And I think if you, perhaps if you drove a Galaxy, you would think it's a lot softer. But it's it's got much dartier steering than the Picasso. And you have to slow down for corners. Not because it's worse around them, it's because it's going much faster. It's just it's much tighter damped 
it's a much more sporty ride. I mean, it's, you know, that's what it's made for. You can really, well, I was gonna say you can really go A to B quite quickly in this, but you can't because you're in the south of England and Mazda 3s exist. So you have to do 25 everywhere. So really, well, you might as well have the Picasso because that does 40, 50 to the gallon. That's probably a fair way to, to put that, I think. Ride, the Picasso gets it, perhaps unsurprisingly. Handling, the S-Max gets it, perhaps unsurprisingly. So you, you, you're not really learning much here, are you? Yeah. This is why I don't do road tests very often. Now, mathematics aren't my strong point, but that to me suggests that they've both kind of scored the same number of wins each. So it's a draw. I was neither right nor wrong to replace a Picasso with an Asmax. Ah. Ah. Wife wanted one of those. Yeah. She wanted one of them. She didn't want the Picasso anymore. Yes. So that, yeah, that's why. That's why. So yeah, there we go. So the S-Max wins, unfortunately. I'm sorry, Picasso, you have been an amazing machine, but you have met your match in a newer, more advanced car, which is a fairly predictable outcome, really. It's like I said at the beginning, this wasn't really a very fair test because they're totally different. So yeah, sorry, I think I've wasted your time. Oh, cat. Thank you.